All fascist doctrines at the end have to refer to the body, to race, to identity, to uh, something pre-linguistic, to something that cannot be mediated, to something that is unquestionably uh, identitarian. And that is one of the places that theater is really important. Right? To school us in the necessity of thinking. Ah, yes, it's actually a world of interesting <laughs> possibilities, but... Um, oh, my... Yeah. I spent the whole week teaching a seminar in uh, again, once again, on uh, online. And uh, ah. it's a really... It's, uh, on some level, actually, it uh, has produced, strangely, a more democratic uh, mm -hmm. uh, speaking arrangement because uh, you have to actually wait until everybody has spoken and you have to see. So it's not like when you have a seminar room and a table And you have dominant voices usually. Yes. Uh, so it actually leads to a certain kind of democratization of the seminar process. But at the same time, it's completely exhausting. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. after a couple of hours of, of, of staring at the screen. Yeah, it's terrible. It can be terrible. Uh, yeah. But you can also get up and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, there, yeah. are, uh, there are different... Which yes. actually, I will warn you right now, at some point, I will go make myself a coffee. <laughs> That's no problem. That's no problem. So, wow, there's Mariah. We see you. And we Hello. See you. Okay. you have to... You ha uh, Hello, Mariah. Yeah. Great. Hi, Felix. She, she, looks, she, she looks the most... That looks really professional, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. I have to make... I, have so to, then I don't have to say anything smart because I, have I to look make very a, professional. So. No, I but you may have to sing soul or blues. Or so. <laughs> uh, so, well... How? Wait, wait, wait. I'm actually sitting in my guest bedroom, so not so professional after all. I will, I will reveal... <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> does not matter we actually we, we we experimented a little bit also with this zoom for 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 theater so we had a workshop with young people and actually what is interesting is if you have a neutral background mm -hmm. you, i just it's very funny because i just put the computer on some arrangement and the wall behind me and the the room was totally untidy it was all a mess but the camera was just on me and on a clean white mm -hmm. on a clean white uh, yeah. wall and yeah. uh, so it it's had the a, magic of the television studio yeah 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 everything can be tiny a mess, little but, spot but uh, I mean, but you are clean and clear <laughs> <laughs> it's very theatrical in a yeah. way you make a little spot of clarity well we are used make a to mess. theater that already uh, takes into account the video technology too right I mean since the 70s at least yes yes. yeah, yeah. Mm, so with, we with mixed uh, results but but some yes. of really great results yeah that's true I, one of the things I'm really proud of is uh One of the reviews of um, the Räuber Inszenierung, the, the Räuber, the, 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 the Thieves of by Schiller that we made in uh, Weimar uh, is uh, an exemplary use of video on the stage. Uh, <laughs> that was so, a, it was said about you in the critique. Yeah, it was written in a critique. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm very proud of that. So I think that it's now it's uh, the, now. It, as the technology now advances, now it becomes incredibly more interesting, this thing of projection, because you can you have this phenomenon of mapping that you can really use the, the projectors and point it and then you can create some kind of illusions and really yeah. put it on the surfaces of the... And it's really, mm. really of, impressive. Of the architecture, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really impressive. If there's a... If there's a good video artist and um, if it's mm. somehow, yeah, going, um, being a part of the of the performance. At the same time, it can also become a distraction from 
as a, just a kind of an, an, an inclusion in an immersive uh, experience rather than a, 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 a product of a dramaturgical mm. uh, need. So it, it can have both effects, the advance of technology, mm -hmm. but that, that it's also misused as a kind of Im uh, immersive experience where you basically sit in a cinem cinema uh, yeah. or a, a, and, and, and then you take away maybe some of the specific yeah. causalities that uh, a theater can produce. Yeah, it can be very easy. No, you want uh, you want yeah. a house in the countryside. Here is a house in um, the countryside. You want uh, <laughs> yeah, stormy this is, sea. Yeah, yeah. Here is it, this is one of the problems because, of course, the, the theater is a space of fiction, which since the beginning of the 20th century lost to cinema. So has other, but has other other values because the theater can make something invisible. Some visible, but for that it has to stay also invisible, no? Somehow. I mean, to me, <laughs> the, cent the, the central medium of theater is language. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so the relationship to image has to be determined dramaturgically through its relationship to language. And uh, uh, cinema tends to a certain type of realism. And uh, uh, in in theater, the over determination of language that you can mean more than one thing is something that you can work on in a in, in, a, in a better way than in cinema, maybe. So, mm. um, yeah. but I, I I don't really want to talk about the one against the other. I love both. But yeah, <laughs> At, actually, I want. Yeah, I wanted to say that. I, actually, I I always said. I like being a theater actor. I like mm. making theater as an actor myself, but I like more watching films. <laughs> 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 no, it depends. Uh, uh, it's just a fact. I, 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 I have my own version of this. Is that what I really love about theater is the process of making it and not so much of having mm -hmm. made it. But uh, uh, <laughs> Because <laughs> afterwards the problem starts. Where do <laughs> yeah. No, not only that, but it's also not, it's just not so interesting to me. I mean, of course, I like to have uh, success mm -hmm. or uh, I like to be praised or not. Uh, and I don't like so much to be criticized uh, like anybody else. But uh, um, what I really love about theater is the process of making it, uh, the, the community of makers. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that already has a, a relationship maybe to why I found a home in Agora. Mm. That's mm. a great starting point. Now we have to mm. start the podcast. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Welcome to the White Room. Felix <laughs> Enslin, thank you for being here. And hello, Mariah also. Mariah Nee. Good, good morning. In Amsterdam. Morning. And Felix, Again. you're in Cologne? Cologne, yeah. And also good morning to all of you. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And this is our 20th episode, our, our number 20. In the one of the last episodes of the year 2020, and um, yeah, we were talking that maybe we can we will change a little bit something about the a podcast because you you said that maybe we could uh, start to to make something regular, no, Mariah? Uh, you, yeah. You you yeah. You, su you suggested to me that we could do it every two weeks to have some to have some kind of rhythm, and I I find it very uh, good somehow because then we could. We could uh, establish a kind of a rhythm, and we could also say to people, "We invite you actually there, and you can come into the room." So there is a room mm -hmm. which opens on Monday at eight or something, and then we we are there, and and we have some more kind of yeah stable rhythm. Yeah, yeah, it will help, I think, to establish a room as a real space that uh, that pops up, and then uh, we can also put our energies there and indeed the guests can come with us and uh, the listeners have a little bit better sense when the next time the room will be open yeah, yeah I think and we could, could be I, I, nice. would, I would also like to experiment with that um, uh, you know that i am a passionate listener to podcasts and mm -hmm. the strange fact is that i never i don't listen to any theater podcast there are in germany there are some 
but basically, uh, for me, I don't know. They are not interesting. The one that I know is to me not so interesting because it's it talks a, a lot about the discourse. Uh, like, is it journal journalistic point of view on the theater? And for me, I I yeah, I like to just speak about what concerns, what are my questions, what are my reflections, being a practitioner, and not so much the big discourse on the theater. That's why. And but in the mm -hmm. in the other podcast world. There is a lot of interesting uh, developments and what I would like to try out with you is also maybe to do it live, you know, to, to meet every two weeks and we set up this because I can also set up very easily a live stream, like a radio, no, where you can, where you can go in and you can listen to it uh, live. And also maybe the Zoom, so we will have television and radio. Yeah, and yeah maybe some, something like this. <laughs> and also to <laughs> we have make some, a multimedia. Also to have some kind of a chat, so uh, so a feedback medium with the people that listen. It maybe uh, is one or ten. I don't know. <laughs> but it would but it would be interesting to have this. This is this phenomenon of the chat. I I, I find it very interesting. Speaking about about online stuff, no. Uh, speaking about online streaming or online content, the chat is a very interesting phenomenon because it's somehow, somehow something that uh, the people, people respond to immediately. Mm. Not not in the same way like before. There was radio, and you had uh, you listened in the evening, but the radio didn't know who was listening to it. But now it can. It's possible that the chat responds, that the people respond somehow, and also yeah, it's, I find it fascinating somehow i don't know why <laughs> well the chat is a kind of language uh, that's interchanged that's intersubjective but at the same time without body yeah so uh, mm. uh I, it has all kinds of consequences you can uh react in a linguistic way and by using language by making a point um and then discontinue your participation in the chat <laughs> but if you are in a room and you make a statement you have to leave the room and close the door behind you if you want to uh, finish your point that's a big mm. difference right so yes it's a it's really a very language oriented uh, medial form and at the same time it uh, disinhibits Uh, certain kinds of uh, boundaries that one might normally have in, uh, in in participating in a discourse because you can simply type it in your computer and if you don't like the reactions you can close the apple uh, and <laughs> and discontinue <laughs> go to <laughs> another chat <laughs> go, yeah, to, another yeah, 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 go yeah. to another chat yeah. or maybe maybe even have two or three at the same time right? yeah. so Yeah. Mm. This is how opens a lot of other topics. Also, mm. the phenomenon of the commentaries in YouTube. I yes. can't understand it. How can people? But I, somehow I can understand it. To sit down and write a commentary and say I like this or I don't like it, and uh, it's very, very. Especially strange. when when you see some, you know, a concert fragment or some some uh, 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 nice thing that 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 a, an artist has made or a person has made, and someone puts the little thumb down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, why? What, we, we, what is your motivation here? But I mean, it happens in real theater too, right? People go out after the premiere or after a, a staging and look at each other and like raise an eyebrow and say, what the <laughs> fuck did we just see? It's like, uh, what was that? Uh, I mean, that, that happens in, in, in theater too. It's actually more often than not, probably. I mean, uh, a theater, the, the theater going audience is very willing to be critical. <laughs> it's the sense. Yes, it, it, it's the. It's somehow the sense of the break, also, no, in the big theater and the opera that you have the break yeah. and the people gather yeah. together, have the red wine and lament on the <laughs> on the director's choices. <laughs> Why would he burn this rabbit on stage or something? Ah, oh, that's gross. <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why would he kill the chicken on stage? That's yeah. The, the, That is a famous incident in the history of Agora when uh, uh, in uh, As Gunas Bestias uh, was the title of the piece. I wasn't with uh, Agora at the time, it's a long time ago. 
And uh, Marcel Kramer, the founder of Agora, decided to have a real chicken killed during the production. Um, uh, and it was a huge, huge, huge scandal um, with animal rights people. Uh, mm. Agora itself, I think, dwindled to a third of its membership because people objected to it. Uh, uh, eating it was, chicken every day. Yes. <laughs> I mean, of course. I mean, the, the, the dramaturgical explanation is is easy enough. Is uh, why are we so unwilling to see something on stage that we are every day consuming in much worse uh, industrial processes uh, in in our consuming behavior, in our, our dietary habits? Mm. But uh, but this is also something about theater, right? It's a difference if you see something actually happening mm. or if you um, can consume a, a product that is enclosed in cellophane and you just open it up and put it <laughs> in your little. pan and it's a <laughs> and it, it, it's a crispy little chicken and you like to eat it for dinner right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a difference mm. 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 but I'm looking forward to seeing your podcast as a I, I see you are working towards a medium media empire where you develop yeah. uh, TV and video, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah, Turner, like yeah. Turner inventing CNN. You are developing yeah. the next, the next, the uh, next big empire. The next, yeah. the next Steve Bannon <laughs> war room, but for independent yeah. theater. Yes, yes. <laughs> the alternative media Ken FM of of the mm. stage. I don't know. No. Yeah. It's uh, you just have to find a little Rupert Murdoch to back it. Yeah. Yes, no, uh, you, you become you become the Rupert Murdoch. Yes, yes, I yes. Think the idea. No, yeah. but was he ever active as a journalist himself? I, I don't know. I don't know about his biography. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of potential uh, there somehow. Uh, and and the best the best. I mean, it's not that now hundreds of people are listening to to us. But uh, but uh, there, it's a, it's a project born out of a very simple idea, a sim very simple necessity of myself and then also of Maria because she responded with when I asked her to do this podcast, she kind of responded enthusiastically. You regret it now. I like to talk. Sorry. <laughs> you regret it now. No, I I very much <laughs> enjoy. Actually, Simon, you you got me onto podcasts big time. Oh. There's an amazing philosophy podcast that I uh, that accompanies oh, me on my that? walks. Uh, Stephen West philosophizes this. Mm. He manages to race through the history of philosophy in actually very engaging and and enlightening enlightening way. It's a, mm. it's a very good introduction. There, yes, and it's incredible because, especially in Germany, in the USA, there is the, the it. Um, emerges a kind of a podcast mm -hmm. universe where a lot of things are possible i mean you are not restricted to any rules you can have a you can have a show which lasts six hours or five minutes you can uh, have uh, uh, people pay for your uh, content via some some kind of system or you can just give it out like this and ask for donations or uh, or just just give it out like this or and you can have yeah, it's 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 a very interesting uh, kind of uh, world, which is now, as every incredible uh, free uh, system, uh, being threatened by large platforms <laughs> to be um, because it's a big market. Also, Spotify is uh, already bought the biggest podcast in the USA, which is the Joe Rogan Experience, which is a very influential uh, podcast somehow. Um, and uh, it's now on Spotify, only on Spotify and not anymore. But there's also this counter movement, let's say, which is uh, independent. And and my entrance, I, I, I listen to a lot of politics things and I listen to, strangely, to tech podcasts. I don't know why. I started to, to listen to these guys who invented also this software, which we are on now, which I'm using now to publish everything. And um, also this kind of sphere, it's all around this Chaos Communication Club. Uh, Felix, you maybe 
Mm. Uh, know them it's uh, in germany they're quite famous Hamburg, yeah, uh, yeah quite famous hacker community that has uh, old roots like roots in the 80s and 90s and um, it's a very interesting community they have a very big festival at the end of the year which is called the chaos uh, congress the congress the chaos communication congress and there's a lot of they define themselves as nerds no they're all nerds so kind of uh, freaks uh, people who, who are enthusiastic and obsessed with with anything that they like to find out what it is and program and um, but uh, very interesting people and these congresses they always take place at the end of the year they have be they have become a, a, like a big very big so 10,000 20,000 people come there and there's a lot of talks and workshops around the core element is Uh, internet security no? and uh, data and everything which is concerned about that because they care a lot about about privacy rights and uh, and um, yeah uh, living happily in a, in the in a, in a digital universe which is threatened all the time by state or corporate uh, agents who want to um, Uh, who are uh, mining our data and making money out of it and um, observing, uh, tracking any th everything. And this is always under threat and they fight for a free internet. And this is one of the important topics <laughs> of today. One of no, the, the to, important to, topics. To bring, it, to, <laughs> to bring it back to the theater yeah. for a moment, yeah, yeah. this is precisely... You know, you can't really prohibit people coming together and telling other people a story. You you can do that, of course, but then you have to use physical violence. Uh, you can prohibit or control or monetize, make corporate uh, digital communication quite easily. But uh, if you come together in a room and you tell a story to others, and then discuss it with them, or they discuss it among each other, that's uh, much harder to control. Mm. Yeah. So I just wanted to, that, that is, uh, this, I'm interested somehow in, in, in finding a form with Mariah, so I like this suggestion that we do it every two weeks somehow, to, re to explore this, yeah, this form. And uh, I think it's, it's, um, It has uh, potential because, uh, as I as I, I I think that in our bubble, let's say in our scene of people, that there is are uh, still some listeners to to uh, <laughs> to uh, um, to find. So, I think this form of reflecting, of speaking to each other, especially in, in these times, uh, will stay. Uh, and uh, uh, for me. It's also a very nice pretext to talk to interesting people, to say. <laughs> I could also call them and say, hello, Felix, how are you? My <laughs> name is Simon. I would like to talk with you about uh, what you're doing and about Agora, but it, now it makes more sense. I can say, I have a podcast, I want to talk to you. Hmm. Actually, is, uh, 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 Simon, mm. this, uh, uh, what you are saying about the theater podcast that is created by critics or has this mm -hmm. critical... I think there is a very interesting uh, uh, sh uh, that our point is on makers, usually people who are actually involved in making theater or maybe teaching theater uh, or are actors or doing anything that is involved in the process of making. And it just connects with me with what you were saying, Felix, on uh, that you rather make theater than look at it. And I think it's a very specific different position that we are speaking together now from that position as makers and actually uh, I would love to hear at some point um, what that means to you in the way that you present and and run your theater and how you would see maybe a shift or an opening in how audience could be involved more in that juicy part Or how this juicy part could maybe spill out a little more of the theater. Yeah, let's come to that slowly. I yeah. Uh, it it's just an association I have, and maybe it will come in the course yeah, yeah. of the of the talk. 
It will come. This was the first uh, when I had uh, this announcement that maybe we are going to make that every two weeks. And uh, Mariah, maybe we are also going to make a Christmas special. No? <laughs> kind, or kind of ho, end, ho, ho. End, end of the year year episode okay. and uh, we have the we have the plan to make something. I, I volunteer as ruler of the reindeer. Yes. <laughs> and we will <laughs> and I'm think we are we are thinking of some kind of episode we want to bury this year somehow or blow it up and uh, look back on what we what everybody did and make a kind of We uh, can uh, inject it with hydrochloros with uh, chloroquine. Yeah, we uh, inject hydrochloroquine <laughs> into 2020 <laughs> and uh, and let it blow Explode up it. and um, so this is a this is a plan we will think about that still and uh, announce it and yeah, invite invite everybody also you Felix we would it would be very funny to only if I can come as wood of the rain. Yeah, good. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we're speaking with Felix Enslin, and um, I didn't know you since uh, uh, until today. I still don't know you, so <laughs> it's very good. Um, I called you because I wanted to speak about Agora Theatre. Um, and uh, I don't want to say a lot about it because maybe you should introduce them. Agora Theater is a is a is a, is a independent theater group or theater ensemble from Sankt Witt in Belgium, and it's a very 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 small town. And it this year uh, Agora Theater is uh, celebrating its 40th year anniversary. I have to say, it's a very bad choice for a year to <laughs> celebrate <laughs> the anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> this was our. Wow. This is the, the. This is the invitation, and this is the schedule for our jubileums uh, festival. Yes, uh, which we had to cancel. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we can laugh uh, because yeah, I, I also was invited by by Karen. Karen yeah. is one of the actresses. I know her yeah. personally. Mm -hmm. And she invited us from Studio 7 uh, to come. And I said, yeah, maybe, let's see. And then she wrote me, everything is cancelled. And it Ugh. was very, very sad. But now I find it also very funny somehow. <laughs> and this is, uh, this was actually also the occasion that I, uh, yeah, th that's why I wanted to to invite invite you to speak about, because of this occasion, 40 years of Agora Theater and also a book came out. Mm about the founder of the theater who's called Marcel Marcel Kremer he died in 2009 i think uh, and uh, one of the connections is that also my director Christoph Falke he uh, in the in the past let's say in the 90s uh, he they they uh, he, uh, they had some contact and he 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 told me uh, some stories about the the, the performances and uh, how Marcel uh, was and he was very fond of the Agora Theater always, and uh, they visited each other. So uh, I I know uh, um, I was I'm very interested in in the story of this uh, theater, and I managed to see also two performances which I liked very much, and um, one was Hannah Arendt of der Bühne, which would be in English mm -hmm. Hannah Arendt on stage, mm -hmm. and the other is. Uh, Three Lives of Antigone by Slavoj Žižek. And these two performances uh, have also been created with you, Felix. Um, yeah, so... So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions here. The, the history of Agora and then the contemporary uh, productions that I was part of. Uh, and there is also a dialectic in those two questions, since I was not part of the history of Agora. I came mm -hmm. only recently, uh, and after the death of Marcel Kremer, I never had a personal relationship to him, I never met him. But um, his successor, Kurt Poten, uh, met me uh, to a quite uh, incidental uh, relation. Both of our children went to the Jewish kindergarten in Cologne, and we met at the third uh, birthday of my oldest child. And uh, uh, he 
kind of haunted me down and continuously asked me to come and be part of one of the festivals, uh, do a, a podium discussion or... And then I said to him, well, I don't do podium discussions generally uh, because I don't believe in their efficacy, but if I could do a workshop and then talk about what we talked about, then I can come. And so he made that possible. And um, uh, that's three years ago, or even more than that, October, three years ago, yeah. And um, so I went there, and it was in a Agora style that I came to understand better as more as I had contact with it. But uh, my first reaction was it was quite a bit hippie-esque, um, and, uh, people were very optimistic and positive about the possibility of theater and communication and uh, teaching each other to be better human beings. And so I named my workshop uh, Einübung in uh, uh, die in den Pessimismus. Also I, uh, that left, training uh, in pessimism. Uh, training in pessimism. That's yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, um, uh, and it it was a quite interesting experience, and I really love the community and and the energy and the sincerity that I realized there. And at the same time, I thought that there was a kind of reification of uh, dead idol. I mean, there is a there is somebody who who had done incredible work and and been a founder in the real sense of the term. He founded something that outlived his own existence. That is what a founder is. Uh, and um, and the various, in a, I started to understand the specific political conditions uh, that Belgium is a really crazy country with a very, very difficult federal structure. Um, and one of the elements of that structure is that there are three cultural communities, the German language community, the smallest by far, the French community and the Flemish community. But since the 80s, they are considered to be equal, they are to have equal rights. And that led to the fact that the German speaking part has a parliament, has a, uh, has a regierung, uh, uh, an administration, and also money for cultural um, events and an interest in uh, stabilizing the identity of the German-speaking part. And uh, so contrary to, for example, to Elsass or Lothringen in France, where uh, German-speaking regions are now mostly Francophone, I mean, the, the German exists, and there are also German language theaters there, but Generally, the, the communal language is French. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the German language survived there very much. It's a, it's, it is the everyday language. It is what we, people speak to each other. And the genius of Marcel Kremer, I think, in its fo founding gesture of Agora, was to create a German language theater that was clearly directed at... Uh, keeping up the heritage of German ling uh, language culture within that region, but had never a separatist or identitarian ideology, but was always directed towards the upper parts of Belgium and towards the whole of Europe. And one of the effects that that has is that most of our pieces with the same um, actors and actresses are staged in at least two languages, French and German. And not by another director and another set of uh, players, but by the same players and with the same director. And uh, and so this is a, was to me a really fascinating um, uh, uh, identity of a theater that, on the one hand, very clearly had its relationship to language and say and, and, and make the statement it is about keeping that language alive and keeping the 
history and the uh, literature of that language alive, and at the same time being extremely open to connections to the outside or to the other or to its own othering for others. Uh, and uh, uh, that to totally fascinated me. And, and, and in addition to that, it was a layman's group originally. Mm. Um, and to this day, uh, and, and out of that, maybe out of the necessity of it uh, originally, but it became a, in a certain way an ideological standpoint. Uh, alle machen alles, everybody does everything. Uh, so uh, the tradition is also that the, the players travel with a the truck, they build their own stage, they, uh, uh, somebody might be um, a sound person in one play and a player in the next play uh, be responsible for um, getting uh, context to other theaters in one moment, but being on stage the other moment. So there is a, and, and that of course has changed a bit, the more complex our productions became. And maybe I'm at fault to a certain degree to some, for some of those changes, because I brought more complex and more uh, simply longer or more, more demanding productions. Uh, but um, uh, they existed before me too, and they managed. Uh, so it's it's no longer it. There exists a certain structure. There are there is a Leitungskreis, a, an administrative circle. But it is still basic democratic. Every three years, every two years, actually, uh, the whole membership of Agora, which is defined by everybody who was part of a production in the last years. And, and or or ever, and then if you continue to show up for the meetings, for the general meetings, you are continue to stay a member of Agora. Uh, um, and if you become part of a production, you become a member of Agora. And the ensemble of all members votes every two years for the leadership and for every position, including all the plays and pro uh, projects that we make. So uh, it's not simply an intendanten model, uh, a, a model of a, of, a, of a leader that decides what to show, but you have to get a majority of the membership behind each project, uh, uh, which is not always easy, of course. And is also not as uh, Rousseauian as one might imagine. I mean, we don't meet under a blooming tree and drink uh, tea and all love and hug each other. There are hierarchies. There are uh, uh, developments that come with professionalization. And that is what happened to Agora. Agora now is a theater that probably has a volume of about a million a year. Uh, with that comes responsibility, with that comes uh, uh, biographies, people who, who are dependent on earning money through Agora in order to live their life. Uh, uh, we have, I think, 13 members now that are in, in part-time or full-time uh, uh, employment positions. Sorry, or 13? People like 13, 13 yeah. or 13? Yeah. 13. One, three. 13, 13, one, three, yeah. And, uh, and then in addition to that are people like me who come through individual contracts, I mean, for a specific piece or for, uh, for advising a certain project or whatever. Um, so, of course, with that kind of professionalism and responsibility, also in relation to the state who gives the money, you have to document what you do with it, comes... Uh, uh, a certain institutionalization that, that certainly has happened. But actually that is kind of what I am interested in is because I'm not anti-institutionalist. I believe in institutions. I believe they're extremely necessary in order to create spaces of freedom and, and spaces where uh, people can develop voices that haven't been heard before or styles that haven't been seen before. Um, but at the same time, I believe in 
basic democracy democracy and uh, and so we have a always a fragile but still living institution that at the same time has a basic democratic structure every two years everything is back on the table um, every position is back on the table and uh, that doesn't exclude the fact that reifications take place I mean of course uh, uh, the, for example, our uh, Künstlerische Leiter, the our artistic head of artistic Agora, director, uh, di director since um, since the death of Marcel Kurt Poten, hasn't changed in the years since the death uh, uh, of Marcel, but uh, for good reason because he's done a great job <laughs> and to to. I mean, he's voted. He's voted every two years. Every two years, mm -hmm. yeah, and and he has no guarantee even of employment if he is voted out. So, uh, I mean, of course, people wouldn't be assholes. They, I mean, I don't think uh, if the people decided next the next time that he shouldn't be a, a artistic director anymore, I, I hope they would find a solution that doesn't make him a a social skeleton. But. Uh, um, uh, I wanted to say the positive thing. The reason that he is re-voted is because he managed actually something that is very, very rare to experience. We have a lot of, in the free, free scene, we have a lot of uh, groups that are dependent on a founder, on a, on a, on a leading voice or on a couple or a, a triple of, of leading voices, and they rarely survive uh, the death or the disengagement of that person. And Agora is a prime example of maybe one of the most uh, shining examples I personally know of, at least, that survived uh, this death of the founder and at the same time stayed true to the values and uh, uh, logic that created the foundation in the, in the first place. And so we, Kurt and I, when we started working together, we talked about uh, the fact that you know it is necessary sometimes to refound a foundation. Uh, it is, but in relation to the founding, not 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 as one's own voice only, but in in a, in a in a discussion with that voice. And out of this, this actually this book project. Um, uh, developed also it, it existed before a kind of idea to publish the non-published texts of Marcel Kremer after his death uh, Viola Streicher uh, his uh, last um, special other uh, had the rights and the volumes of those texts and um, uh, gave it to Christel Hoffmann a, a, a figure in the youth theater uh, that is very well known and and then once we started working together a couple of years ago Kurt and I decided to add the dimension of the contemporary Agora to, to, to describe the process of transition um, together with the old texts, in order to not make it a, a, a Torah mm -hmm. of the of the one word that is uh, true, but to both pay homage and to say we can learn something from Marcel and at the same time present our contemporary work. So in this book, there is also texts about uh, Hannah Arendt and about Animal Farm uh, and about the development since then. So now I, I try to answer like five questions at the same time. I'm sorry, it was very long. <laughs> um, please re-engage and uh, direct me. <laughs> it's very, very fascinating to hear and, and extremely inspiring, uh, actually, also. Um, I'm, I'm uh, still processing a bit what, what you have said, I'm I'm quite involved with the Nordisk Theater Laboratorium the last uh, three years, which is uh, approaching such a moment actually in which uh, Daniel Barber will will uh, leave. 
or not leave exactly entirely, but uh, but at least give his uh, artistic directorship uh, to the Other next hands. hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, uh, I can see what is how, that's turmoil. The Odin, that's the Odin theater. Yes, the Odin theater. Yeah, okay, exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and it just made me think of uh, of other kinds of theatrical institutions that uh, actually very regularly and 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 almost without much noise uh, give over the stick to the next uh, leader. You know, city theaters or national theaters or it's kind of a given that they will survive, right? They have so much uh, buffers around and so much kind of their own. Um, logic well, around. I mean, it's, it's it's it's. I think it's very it's it's very simple on some level. It's a uh, state or stadt theater uh, are funded by communities that have a political structure that definitely will continue. I mean, unless there is a big war or a revolution, um, they will. So the question is never does the theater survive. It is the question: does the mm -hmm. Uh, artistic director survive, right? Or does, uh, the, uh, does, the, the, does the director or does the actress or the actor mm. survive? Um, and yeah. in these kinds of uh, free foundings or community foundings that have a relationship to the state structure because they need funding, and uh, but rarely are simply structurally funded in a way that uh, a mm -hmm. Stadt, the Staatstheater is. Uh, then the continu continuity, and, and I mean, this is a, in a, some sense also problematic, is the continuity is dependent on a exactly. person. That's yeah. on some level also problematic, right? It's, it's a patriarchal structure, right? Uh, uh, on some level. It's a, you, you are dependent on a charismatic figure that leads the community and then has the artistic yeah. well, capacity to convince an audience, right? I guess there's there's a couple of uh, of sides to that. One is the uh, the perspective of micro traditions that you know why would something necessarily survive uh, for for a very long time? That's that's one question. Uh, and the other is is uh, um, you know in Holland we don't have uh, state theaters. Mm -hmm. We have something a little bit similar on a national level. But the, the big difference is that they have split the buildings and the companies. So the buildings are secure. They will mm -hmm. uh, 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 survive. But the companies that inhabit them are more and more kicked into the model of the independent uh, scene, which means that they have to... Um, um, how to say... Convince that, defend. the... Convince Convince exactly. the people who run the houses to invite them, right? Yeah. Not the houses, but the the actually, it's even one step in between that there's the commission on funding, on state funding mm -hmm. that have to be convinced. Mm -hmm. If you have that convinced, you will have for four years mm -hmm. uh, funding, mm -hmm. and then you can play the state theaters. Mm -hmm. Without the funding, it's it's actually impossible to play those theaters so it's a quite a devious system of sneaking in this uh this uh, peril of being independent but still making it very well uh, it has two sides right it has two sides on the one hand it allows newcomers to come and say exactly. we are we are convincing you to give us funding for a couple of years and on the other hand, it uh, makes it extremely dependent on political decisions. I mean, uh, you, you, you lose a certain kind of uh, peer review uh, that is only inside an institution where artistic uh, uh, directors or directresses uh, make the decision and take the responsibility for what content and what aesthetic is being uh, uh, presented. So it has it has it is a complex situation on the one hand it allows a lot of freedom because it's the entry level is easier um right i mean if you want to enter a state or staatstheater you have to go to acting school you have to go to uh you have to be, go to specific acting schools if you really want this chance you have to go to bosch or to mm. go to munich uh, 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 uh and um 
And then you are invited, you get a two-year contract, and if you get another two-year contract and another two-year contract, then you can no longer be uh, mm. uh, uh, <laughs> denied continuation of employment. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you have unions, you have unions that uh, deal with the uh, institutions about how long you work, how long a rehearsal can go, uh, how many rehearsals in a week you can uh, 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 legitimately be employed in. And mm. for groups like ours, we don't have unions, right? <laughs> we, we sind gewerkschaftsfrei. Uh, we, if, if Enslin says we rehearse 12 hours a day, we rehearse 12 hours a day. Uh, uh, and, uh, end of story. <laughs> end of story. And, uh, and uh, so yeah. there's two sides to that coin, right? The, 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 the continuation, I, I believe in states and I'm not against yeah. Staats and Stadttheater. I'm not. At all, no. I, I I believe in their existence. I wish they would be sometimes more open to cooperation with than they are. Hmm. But there are structural impediments. They generally don't have open funds uh, for uh, outside of their own productions, uh, except if they have festivals or something else where they can give extra money. So it's not only bad mm -hmm. will; it's also a structural issue. Uh, but I have learned to believe very much in the free uh, groups, the Freien Gruppen, uh, as yeah. we call them in Germany, uh, as Agora is one, for example, because it allows to create crazy things that nobody else would do. <laughs> yes, true. Mm. Just, just one little short uh, uh, <laughs> reaction on this uh, split. I think that in Holland... Um, what you say about the uh, if you want to work in a state theater, you have to have the theater school. The, you have to have. I think this has come to to be true for all the arts in Holland because of this controlling mm -hmm. situation of the funding bodies. That they actually the independent scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. and and it's very much on. Uh, uh, it's very much controlled, actually, and artistically controlled. So a situation of a theater that's coming from this grassroots feeling, as it seems uh, uh, Agora has grown, mm -hmm. it would have, um, it would firstly be completely put into a very separate box from which they would never escape, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is the theater, community theater or amateur theater. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and it would be completely controlled also who's... Uh, I mean, in, in a certain sense, we have this experience contemporarily too. Mm. Maybe particularly with also the moment in which I started working with Agora. Uh, I've never done youth or children theater before. I uh, Actually, right now, tomorrow I will, or after, in two hours, I will leave for... Uh, Rehearsal for a, a piece Telemachos on the son of Odysseus that is for eight year olds and up. It's my oh, first, uh, the, the first time I, I do something like this together with Kurt Porten, the uh, uh, artistic director. It's a it's a Klassenzimmerstück. It is really bare bones. Mm. It's supposed to be able to be played in any classroom or uh, in any room. Uh, it's a one person piece. But I want to say one thing about the comment you just made. Um, there is an in-between in a situation like Agora, because uh, since Agora on the one hand has a certain structure and legitimacy in relation to the politics and a certain structural funding, uh, Kurt Porten, for example, can go and uh, many of our players are laymen. The mo most of them have not gone to theater school. And, and can pick out somebody. Uh, I, I work very closely with one player in particular, uh, uh, Galia de Bacca. I made a solo with her and she's been in every play that I've, 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 I've directed. She studied history, right? And uh, she comes from a theater family, if one is honest, right? There is, there is a certain uh, <laughs> uh, affinity. Um, but uh, she's never seen a, a theater school or a directing school a day in her life. Mm. 
and uh, uh, Okara that you mentioned before. Uh, the, uh, she, uh, I think, studied pedagogy and and and, and sport pedagogy. Um, and she's a player. She she, she was in uh, two of my plays. She's a great player. Uh, she said, but not. She never saw an, a school from the inside. So there is an a intermediate position that institutions or semi-institutions like Agora or free groups can have if they have a continuity to be able to pick out people and say, yes, there is an interest, there is a desire, there is a capacity, there is a, an energy, a, an ability. We want that to be part of our process and we don't have to legitimize that in relation to a political body to say, yes, we chose this person because it, she went to the right schools or she went, uh, she, she can document her uh, uh, legitimacy to be part of this ensemble. We can make that decision ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, that is maybe by uh, Agora, again, I'm sure there are other ensembles like us, but it's very special in that sense that there is a certain, because of the political impact of saying there should be German language theater in the community, mm. yeah. on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, a big freedom. But, and this is the big but that you just mentioned also, there is also a danger of being pigeonholed, of being in a schublade gesteckt. Namely, you are the youth and ch child children theater specialists because your des the desire of politics is that through pedagogical and through the opening to that age group, we legitimize our existence. And then we have a hard time sometimes. Uh, getting acknowledgement for the theater we do also for adults, uh, for the Abend program, for the evening program. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a dialectic that we also have to live with. And particularly maybe I had to learn to live with because I, I quite naively started to work with uh, Agora and just made what I wanted to make. And then I realized, oh, we also have to sell this stuff. Uh, And mm -hmm. but when you when you knock on doors and say you agora, uh, they say okay for uh, what age eight or ten or five, <laughs> and I say well, uh, and, and, and I say well you know twenty uh, and up. Uh, oh, hmm. <laughs> then it, 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 it becomes a problem. Then <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating how this political situation of Belgium has worked to uh, to your Advantage. favor. Actually, yeah. it's yeah. very, you know, if it's, you would if you would make a market research, you would almost say, okay, you know, in the context of uh, equality and political rights, pick a pick a region where there is a minority that uh, <laughs> needs a voice. And uh, and go, but I guess Marcel Kramer was from that region. He was. He was. I mean, that is, and, and that is also a big difference to myself, for example. Yeah. Uh, also, Kurt Poten yeah. comes from the area. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the players that I work with, we still have a lot of players from the area. Also, by the by now, migrant members of the area. Yeah. For example, we have a, a Nikita. He's from White Russia, uh, from Belarus. Uh, um, but is a member of the uh, community, uh, so mm. it, it 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 develops now also dialectical relationships. And other one must say that maybe also not only to its advantage, um, the German-speaking part of Belgium is one of the widest regions probably we have left in Europe. I mean, there is not ex mm. there is not an extreme amount of. Um, migration there and that's also something that uh, we discuss inside Agora uh, how do we deal with that because that is a very mm. contemporary issue and a contemporary question but mm. at the same time we insist on saying we have this problem already in our DNA I mean we are dealing with uh, francophone players uh, German speaking players players um, from the Flemish uh, part Yeah, you have them too. You have them too, yeah. The Not many, but a few, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And some plays have also been played in Flemish. 
but normally it's French and German. And we, in, in the basic language, the, I mean, most productions or all productions are first made in German. And, um, but we have, I mean, in, in Animal Farm, I had uh, two francophone play, players in uh, 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 Antigone, I think at least three, uh, and Annabella from Belarus. Uh, hmm. uh, now Telemachos, the, the, she's actually a trained actress, but uh, she's uh, francophone originally. She's learning German as she goes along. And the premiere is in German. Uh, wow. And then we yeah. do a French French version of the play, so yeah, we have this. Useful. We 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 have a we have a and I'm, actually my French is you know rudimentary, uh, and I directed a French version of uh, of 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 both my plays. I mean a, a big place. It's a, I, I had help. I got myself help from colleagues who are francophone because I don't get all the nuances. Um, right. Um, or Galia de Bacca, as I said already, she speaks, she studied German uh, because she studied in history in Germany. So she speaks German fairly well, but she's Francophone by origin. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions of identity and language and mm -hmm. their relationship already inscribed into our very being. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and as a minority, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think in the the consciousness of Belgium, this German speaking minority, for most people, it it is it, non-existent. I yeah. think it's not not really existing. No? And there's a big no, thing I made mean, of the French. I, I know, of course, it's a it's a bit uh, one 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 uh, hesitates a little bit to consider a German speaking uh, population as a minority, right? Uh, I mean, and, and historically, uh, of course, there was also uh, uh, the conflicts that come along with that, right? And, uh, during uh, the Nazi occupation, uh, or before that even, the Heinz Treue Front, the Front uh, uh, Faithful to its home mm -hmm. had uh, was a Nazi party inside the German speaking part that was close to the National Socialists. Um, yet at the same time, it was never uh, annexed. It wasn't like the Sudetenland in Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. or, uh, that it was made part of the uh, Reich of the, of the German state body. It remained an occupied territory, and uh, and it was also ambivalent the the whole relationship to um, hmm. national so national socialism. And uh, uh, there is, a, if I if I may finish with one thing, is uh, one of the there's a very funny interview with uh, Marcel Kremer that's uh, you can find it online on our pages, uh, where he said we are from the Agora. And the König sind die letzten Belgier. We are the last Belgians. The, the king and we are the last Belgians because we are really we really believe in in the existence of Belgium. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> I mean, and the, the king is not really a Belgian either. I mean, yeah, it, was exactly. a, it was a huge problem to get that king there. You know, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. where they got him from in the end. <laughs> But that, that's exactly what I. <laughs> Ultimately, they all get their kings from the the English got their kings from Germany, the Belgians got their kings from Germany. Yeah, that's true. And it's, <laughs> the Dutch all marry the Germans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this exactly what what actually I wanted to uh, to just ask: um, uh, Is there any kind of uh, nationalism in that tiny part? Because I know in Flanders and in the uh, uh, especially in Flanders, no, it's I, I, it's going, I, I it's rising. It's, It, uh, I mean, of course, it would never be appropriate to say that it doesn't exist. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it is, it's not a political force. It's not a political force like Flanders Belang or uh, uh, yeah. other parts of, uh, of Belgium. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this is maybe a bit uh, uh, hybris on my I part see. to say that, yeah. uh, <laughs> on the part of Agora, uh, speaking for Agora, I think it has 
to do with the cultural, with the fact that the cultural identity is secure, and uh, uh, it, there is no, there is no, there is no fight about um, Francophonisierung, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, which originally happened for a while, right? Uh, I mean, Marcel Kramer, when he was a young man, put posters up, Wallonie nie. Yeah, also, uh, 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 never uh, Wallon, never yeah, yeah, Wallonie. Ne yeah, never francophone. Yeah. Uh, that is, that is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then he created a theater whose mark was that uh, most plays were made both German and French, right? And that is, I think that is, that is part of, I, I don't think Agora is responsible alone for that. I, I also think that they, they had sensible politicians. I mean, they, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, there's, there's always a, a, a multitude of reasons for developments like this, mm. but there is no strong, uh, uh, nationalist movement. Also because, I mean, any nationalist movement that would have uh, exist would basically have to say we are part of Germany. Right. And, uh, exactly. and I think they live, they live quite, they, they live quite well. And, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean, this is, we are talking about a hundred thousand people, right? We're talking yeah, about exactly. A state I think that's, uh, that, <laughs> that is, uh, that, that is no more than that. Yeah. Yeah, wow, I, mean, I don't it's know. Tiny. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if you remember when uh, there was the EU treaty with Canada, the CETA uh, agreement. This part of Belgium became famous for yeah, a while yeah, yeah. because because their parliament didn't agree to the CETA, and they had uh, under Belgium law they had to also agree to it, and they they wanted to make sure that their cultural identity wasn't threatened uh, by um, by That's the so CETA. So it was a tiny, I mean, the EU is what, 400 million people, right? And this is a part of 100,000. Yeah. And and the big event of a Canada-EU treaty was stalled and changed because of the engagement of that population and, and that parliament. And, yeah. and in, uh, let, me, let me give you another example of, of why I think it's a really special region. The current uh, government has... Um, there is a, a, a Belgian philosopher, uh, David van Rijbroek, uh, oh, who, yeah. uh, uh, who has uh, written a book about um, returning to the ancient Greek tradition of uh, not electing people by representational vote, but by lot, by... Um, by lottery. Yeah, with the, by lottery, the yes. Pot yes. Pottery, yeah. By pottery, yeah. actually, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Originally by pottery, exactly. By, by lottery, pottery. <laughs> and um, the, the, this German-speaking part of Belgium has developed now a Bürgerrat, a second parliament that is precisely developed through wow. lottery mm, mm, mm. And, and actually has real powers. They have the power to initiate uh, law-giving processes, uh, at the end, the elected parliament has to agree, so it's not a full-fledged realization of the idea, but it is real. It is. It has a. It, it has a real. It, a real impact, hmm. and um, and so there is maybe also a, a kind of uh, luxury in a certain homogeneity, also, right? I mean, one one cannot mm -hmm. be only one. Uh, there is not so many conflicts through migration to, uh, that you have uh, in the banlieues in Paris or in in, 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 in in Brussels, and certainly not the conflict between Flemish and f Francophone in like you have in Brussels, because the population is fairly homogeneous. So mm -hmm. this is also <laughs> something that is not it's not without question. Right? There is also something to look at mm -hmm. in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But I think the more the achievement of Agora is uh, great, to, out of this homogeneity, not to simply develop a folk theater mm -hmm. of, of, of national identity, but to develop, develop yeah. a European theater, a truly yeah. European And a theater. dialogue, it seems. Yes. That this, this, uh... Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to come to that because we also talked before, Felix, and uh, I was, I'm so fascinated that the founding moment of this theater, I mean, that the theater has in its name like a cultural identity, uh, 
the Agora, the German speaking theater, no? Of the region. It's, uh, it appears very strange to me as uh, also having traveled in the world a little bit and feeling kind of homeless, uh, proud of being homeless. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, uh, it is very interesting that the theater is tied to that place, to the language, to a kind of cultural identity, as you so said. The, the, and the just to. And that in the founding moment of the theater, uh, Marcel Kremer decided to, uh, uh, or they decided to to make a performance from Peter Weiss, the investigation, mm -hmm. which is deals with German uh, crimes uh, against, uh, yeah, <laughs> humanity against the humanity and uh, uh, the industrial killing of of a lot and a lot of people. Uh, and dealing with its own story, as you said, Heimat Treue Front, no, yeah. and uh, yeah. its own involvement, ambiguous or involvement in the Nazism, and so this, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm wondering if this, I'm wondering what this has to say to us in today's world, where since no, I don't know, since 15 years in Germany, we try to develop some kind of a Heimat. Uh, New, new sympathy towards uh, our Heimat, our home, and there's a lot of local patriotism uh, mm -hmm. coming up, uh, uh, supported by uh, city marketing uh, um, mm -hmm. um, groups who want to make every town special, like our town mm -hmm. now had they made, a, the musicians, some musicians made a hymn of our town, of Schwerte, which is also a very small town. And it's like a pop hymn, and they are on the. Everybody wants their own Bochum song. Yeah, they want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're all. And you have to be like sympathetic and pro at the same time. It's very kitsch. It's very. It's you no. Know, this is a very somehow. Uh, yeah, it has a lot of kitsch and a lot of. Um, mm. uh, uh, I don't know how to say. It's very. It's uh, <laughs> a very simple. A simple concept of, of, of home, yeah. and yeah, yeah, and I th and, and I and feel that we we also can speak about home and about being home somewhere, Heimat, uh, in a in a complex way, and so this is what I want to find out. Yes, I and I, I think this is one of the current questions and the questions that Agora will have to confront in the next years. That um, both things are true. Agora has never been part of that kitschig uh, relationship to Heimat. Although it is true in its early beginnings, the first invitations to countries outside of Belgium were to the German-speaking parts of Denmark, the German-speaking parts of other countries uh, that had sometimes more separatist and nationalist agendas. I mean, that is, that is in the origins of, of, of Agora. But uh, at the same time, they went there with the Amitlung or the uh, uh, Agunas Bestias and not with um, nationalist plays. They went there with plays that actually uh, asked the questions that needed to be asking. And, mm -hmm. and that is the genius of uh, Marcel Kramer. I mean, that's uh, a founding figure, is a founding figure. And Marcel Kramer embodied that contradiction in himself. Uh, he stayed in East Belgium. I mean, he, he directed sometimes, I think, in a couple of state theaters, Duisburg and other places. Um, but he stayed in uh, East Belgium. And uh, even though I'm sure, I mean, I, I saw some of the plays uh, with video, uh, 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 on video that he made, They certainly could have, I mean, he, he was a, a top director in his time. He could have probably made his way in Berlin or in Cologne or in uh, another German-speaking part if he had chosen to do so, and he didn't. He, he, he wanted to have the connection to the roots mm -hmm. of the theater mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and stay with that. At the same time, he brought in Francophone players, German players, uh, uh, players from, uh, uh, we have a Brazilian musician, uh, 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 a guy from Belarus, as I said already. Uh, so it was open at the same time to uh, 
But as I said before, it's a quite homogeneous region. And uh, something like the Bürgerräte, this second parliament through lottery, uh, is probably easier to realize in a community that doesn't feel split between uh, different identities, uh, doesn't have uh, a lot of Magrebinos or uh, 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 migrants from uh, uh, other languages and other religions. Uh, so I don't think Agora or the Deutsche Bayer Gemeinschaft is in the business of, of raising the finger and say, we know how to do it because we also have conditions that are quite uh, feasible for these kinds of experiments. So one of the questions, as I started saying before, for the future of Agora is how to integrate other differences into our process, into our community, into our ensemble that are not immediately located in St. Fit or in the Deutsch Bank Gemeinschafts area because they are contemporary questions that we all need to address and theater needs to be contemporary. Mm. Mm. Mariah's writing something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I find it really uh, great uh, I've, this, uh, I've, this topic I've, and this I want, discussion. Yeah, no, I will cut you off. <laughs> no, I said, Mariah. I, said, <laughs> I want. I want. Uh, <laughs> it, it's Simon, maybe interesting because um, I was thinking about the dark sides uh, of our. So actually, um, I don't know. I have this uh, this phrase. Maybe you can. It, it it stayed with me in your performance, in the performance which you, where you worked also on it, it the ha Hannah Arendt on stage. Mm -hmm. There was this phrase, which I now connect to this whole topic, and it it says, somehow in my, in my memory, it was, mm -hmm. the wolf stays out. Mm, the, the wolf bleibt draußen. Yeah, yes, you know. yeah. so the wolf stays out. So I, I mm. want to, I don't really know, can you maybe explain what what this this was a phrase that kept repeating in this performance about Hannah Arendt mm -hmm. which was a, yeah it was a, a performance on her thinking also a little bit on her biography but uh, yeah. it was a dialogue between Hannah Arendt the old old mm -hmm. woman and Hannah Arendt mm -hmm. the young woman mm -hmm. and there was also another kind of devilish figure like a fox and and then this this motive of the wolf uh, re returns all the time and uh, so This is, yeah. Well, the wolf, of, oh, obviously, in some level, uh, stands for fascism and yes. national socialism. And um, what we try to show in this play, um, uh, Anja Michaelis, the director, I was the dramaturg and co-writer of the play, we, together with her in, in this particular project, I wasn't the director, um, is to say, I mean, interestingly enough, Agora is one of the central uh, concepts in, in, in Hannah Arendt's thinking, right? It's the democratic marketplace of ancient cities. Mm. And uh, with all the problematics that come along with it, right, that we also have in the play, is, uh, of course, the free Agora of ancient times included free white males that had property and not women and not slaves and not children and not uh, and so on and so forth and not foreigners um, but uh, uh, Hannah Arendt has the concept of the space of appearing of appearance or the, the Raum der Erscheinung which is where political action happens and is seen by spectators and judged by spectators and that is what politics is for her the the, the contingent contingent development of political action and uh, it being seen by spec the spectator she calls it also the spectator mm -hmm. like in theater mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is based on a children's book actually we didn't come up all, uh, all by ourselves with that yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 and and so this This was the genius of the student book to bring together this idea of the spectator in Hannah Arendt with the idea of the theater. And, uh, and so there was the necessity of the figure that is also in the children book uh, of the figure that is excluded 
Uh, we also had criticism that we used this wolf, the wolf as the typical bad wolf because nowadays there is a wolf's rights movement uh, that says, okay, we can't uh, uh, continue with the meta metaphorology of, of uh, taking the wolf as the quintessential evil, like in, uh, I don't know, uh, Little Red Riding Hood or in other uh, fairy tales. Uh, but we decided nevertheless to stay with it um, because this was not the wolf, it was the wolf with the language. It was a wolf who uh, uh, tried to seduce uh, the Agora that he was better equipped to develop peace and security and uh, 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 a good life as opposed to the nasty, difficult problem that was associated with Aristotle in the play of actually permanently having to discuss things and having to uh, f figure out what we want and who we are and uh, rather than solving it once and for all. And then there was the fox that was uh, based uh, on a fable that um, Hannah Arendt wrote about Heidegger, where she did it, she, she, she was his, he was her teacher and uh, also her lover. Uh, and um, she described him as the fox who does not like to engage in the world, mm -hmm. who, who goes back to his Fuchsbau. Mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, and so hat. he, yeah, in, in his little foxhole, and mm -hmm. uh, and um, and so he appears as the person who's who who uh, is. Oh, the, 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 the fox appears as the one who wants to get the little Hannah Arendt to think about rather her health and if she has eaten properly or if, uh, uh, if, if she has slept well rather than about the political issues of the Agora. Uh, so, and this is a very Hannah Arendt, this is very close to Hannah Arendt's judgment of Heidegger that he was apolitical, that he, that he, um, state with his thinking of proper being rather than engaging into real uh, uh, into the understanding of how the world really works mm. the nasty the nasty difficult business of permanently having to renegotiate in the agora with language with judgment with uh, spectators over and over again mm. who are we what do we want how do we want it so um, I'm very happy you like the play. I, I love it very much. I think it is a prime example of a play that works beautifully as a children's play um, and at the same time as on the adult level. I think um, it's it, no adult can come out of this play, I think, and not have a meaningful experience. Right? Mm. Uh, it's not like, okay, I just go and take my child and uh, I check my emails while my child is watching the play. Uh, it, 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 is, it engages the adult audience just as much. Yes. <clears throat> I don't remember if the wolf stayed out the whole performance or if he was... No, no, he came, he, 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 he came, he came back and then he, uh, he was disappeared again. I mean, at the end, it's no, it's, there is no conclusion. There is no happy end, right? Uh, mm. uh, there's only the question. It's, uh, it doesn't, it, it, there is no... The wolf is not permanent. I mean, he disappears from the stage, but he comes back one time very centrally. He sits on the central chair mm. and says, I am back and I can give you security and I can mm. give you this and I can. Mm. Give. And then uh, he is kicked out again by the young uh, Hannah. Mm. Uh, so uh, they sing together this rap song where they say, Der Wolf bleibt draußen. Uh, that's the, the, the yeah. phrase that you that yeah, you yeah. remembered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm, mm. But is it uh, this is the que my question? The wolf can he? Do we have to keep him out? What uh, is it? The only possibility to develop, so to exclude the wolf. What is the strategy? Yeah, How to I mean, deal with if, the wolf? If you ask me, yeah. I mean, obviously, since I was part of this project and the director of this project, absolutely. We have to keep the wolf out. We have to keep him. I mean, out, out of out. This means many things: out of yes. power, out of relevance, yes. out of uh, uh, out of uh, being able to determine the discourse. I'm not saying we need to put him in a, a hut and shoot him in the head. 
Yes. Uh, although, if this necessary, is... maybe that that is sometimes <laughs> necessary too. But uh, uh, it's um, you know that this is it's a very very current theme because in Germany absolutely. in Germany we have of course we have the we are under uh, the pandemic measures and everything and there is mm. a lot of protest against that and people normal pe let's say normal people or people who think well it's all. Uh, people who have normal problems and who have reasonable problems also with the mm. current situation, with the pandemic, go into the streets and protest and don't see, or if they see it, they think that, that it is possible that Nazis can come with them on the same protest and they say, well, I don't, I don't care somehow. It's not, it's not my problem. I'm here because I want to say something and they're here. They're also part of the society, no? So people say, there's some kind of people that say or that think we can include or we also have to include these uh, Nazis or the right-wing extremism into the society, into the discourse. And there is I mean, this... I, mean, uh, uh, I, I, can, I can hardly hear the question to its end. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a, in Hannah Arendt's thinking, for example, you have not only handeln, Handel? you are not, not, not only handeln, uh, being acting, active, yeah, act, yeah. Acting. Mm. you also have thinking and judging. Right? Uh, you are not exempt from, just because you act out a political desire that doesn't exempt you from thinking and judging. And uh, if you, if there is If the main position of Hannah Arendt, I mean, I'm speaking now about this one play, right? And not about my mm. own philosophy. Uh, the main position of Hannah Arendt is that politics is politics because it is not guided by your own social being. It is guided by thinking. It is guided by what is necessary for everyone and not necessary for you. And so um, that is actually very much a, a Heideggerian in this in this element of her thinking or from the early Heidegger she's absolutely anti-ressentiment uh, so a politics of ressentiment is not something that she would ever support mm -hmm. because ressentiment resentment resentment uh -huh. yeah so, uh, ressentiment resentment I mean resentment ressentiment means a bit more than resentment it means mm. uh Grudge, a kind of bitter, a bitterness, a Grudge. bitterness with you, a mm. bitterness with your own social station or your own social being, and you make somebody else responsible for it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and you reify that somebody else. You you make it into the two, or you make it into the mm -hmm. scientist, mm -hmm. or you make it into the politician, or, mm. uh, or into the Arab, or uh, uh, whatever. That is. That is precisely what the agora, the marketplace of discourse, is able to disinfect. If you really have this discourse, you will not come to that conclusion. And that is one of the places that theater is really important. That is uh, to school us in the necessity of thinking. And mm -hmm. um, which is why I'm not a great fan of those types of theater apolog apologists that speak about the non the non the anti linguistic the affective purely uh, expressive mode of uh, 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 as being as being the central element of theater you mean you don't like physical theater i i love <laughs> pure, no, I come come, okay. come 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 exactly i mean you saw I'm one and uh, And come in. I'm joking because I, I remember a phrase, I think it was from Peter Brook. He says, yes. physical theater can also be very talkative. Yeah, so exactly. means, yeah precisely. Yeah. So. <laughs> very, very good. I don't know this quote, but I will remember I, it from now on. Um, uh, if you ever saw Animal Farm and you, even the place that you did see, I very much am a believer in physical theater. I am not in a believer in the idea that the body has an arcane knowledge that we cannot transform into discourse. That doesn't mean discourse is absolute, it is never ending, but uh, there is no deep-seated uh, non-linguistic knowledge that uh, 
cannot be transformed. Otherwise, I would not. I would stop doing theater because uh, at the end of the day, theater is the medium that gives us something to hear through the medium of seeing. And that is, um, at least, that is my understanding of theater. I want to come back to the wolf because the, the question is: if the agora, everybody is, has to be allowed, but the wolf has to stay out. This you would say is is true. If I would put it in philosophical terms, the wolf is the person who has contradictory positions, who has self-contradictory positions, who has identitarian positions, who has positions that are that do not allow language to be mm. uh, the medium in which we have to recognize each other and understand each other. Uh, I mean, I understand, you know, I'm a philosopher also. I mean, I understand speculative realism and all the new realisms and materialisms that are out there, uh, object-oriented ontology, other, other things. I am not a total... Uh, adherent to the linguistic turn and saying only linguistic reality is what makes social reality. I don't believe that. What I do believe is that any claim that is non-linguistic, that, that, that claims that there is a higher knowledge in uh, the exclusion of language, is, uh, arouses my skepticism. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is what I want to say. And All fascist doctrines at the end have to refer to the body, to race, to identity, to uh, something pre-linguistic, to something that cannot be mediated, to something that is unquestionably uh, identitarian. Mm. Mm. In the blood and the bones. Yes, and, and, yes. That is, and that is in, in that sense, when I mean the Wolf bleibt draußen means that position cannot be part of the discourse because it is not discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think there's, that's uh, also an, a kind of an interesting problem with the image of a wolf because a wolf is so much an, an entity, a being, that, uh, you know, when you say the wolf is out or you make this image uh, on the stage, it's very easy to understand you mean the person. It, it's it's something the leap is is offered to you to think that when we exclude the wolf we exclude that person whereas we're actually excluding a position a yes. way of thinking that is yes uh, yes but of course that can be identified i mean you can you know, i mean if if your real question is a political question not a theatrical question do i believe that uh certain political positions, when they are actually realized and want to become uh, empowered, need to be excluded? Absolutely, I believe that. Um, yeah. And yeah. by all, yeah. by, uh, to, to say, yeah, exactly. Malcolm X, with, by all means necessary. Mm. Yeah. 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 But it I'm becomes... Really sorry, I love to talk to you guys, but we are approaching, approaching two hours. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when do you have to I'm, leave? Um, basically now. Ah, uh, okay, good. So it have been a few <laughs> minutes. Uh, but I, I very much love this discourse and, and the questions that are raised. I mean, I'm very happy to do this again or to do it again. And so you can cut uh, it together. Um, the only problem is I can't do it immediately because the technical problems we had in... I can try from the theater next week if that is... Or you, or we just keep it and say this is what we managed, and we we we, we, let, one. we let it happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Part one. But, uh, Let's say it's yeah. part one. We yeah. can, we we decide how we want it to be. Maria, mm. part one. I I find it good. Part one is good. Yeah. No, I mean, I I don't want to. Uh, ich möchte mich euch nicht aufdrängen, sondern ich, ich I, I think the discussion shows we have yeah. a lot of topics that are still alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And I'm Sorry. very happy to, to hear you and to hear your questions and to, to, to meet you and to get to know you. So, <laughs> but now it's at 12, 10 minutes, the car is waiting downstairs to take me to Belgium. So, good. Uh, <laughs> so, let, so let's say we are, we are scheduled for a second uh, meeting to okay. continue. Yeah. And uh, 
See you. Either as Rudolf the Reindeer yes. or as Felix Ensley. Yes, <laughs> either. Either. Just not as the wolf. The wolf stays out. Okay. Yeah. See, you, okay. see you, Felix, and give my okay. greetings Bye. to the people at Agora. I do. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Yeah. Ciao.